Yeah, him, yeah, Jacob and his mom. We're going to talk about Jacob and his mom. Yeah, they, they weren't the nicest of people. They're very conniving. We're going to look at that. So thanks for reminding me, Chris. Turn to cha- chapter 25 of Genesis and hold your place there. Garrett, I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Yes. 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 Exactly. Yeah, hold your place in Genesis real quick. Because we're going to be going back and forth there with, through the rest of the study. But be, before we can focus on the patriarch Jacob, we've got to confront these two verses, verse 12 of chapter 11 and verse 1 of chapter 13, because it's troubled the minds of scholars because they, they kind of don't belong in either chapter. They kind of don't believe along in either chapter. The question concerns whether this accusation against Ephraim and Judah belongs to the prior section of chapter 11 or that which follows beginning here in chapter 12. I don't believe, I don't believe it goes to, towards either. This is what is called a, prog, a pragmatic statement in which Scripture sets the stage for the final section of a letter or a book, which is kind of like it's always usually in between two chapters. Exactly. Exactly. And, and sometimes when they when they cut these verses or chapters off, some in some books you, you can see they really didn't do a good job. That's why somebody asked me last week after last week said it, uh, last week said said hey, how come you didn't finish verse twelve? That's going to belong to chapter eleven. It, it didn't. You know, so it, so especially in the Old Testament you see that a lot, very frequently. They're called pragmatic statements. This is almost like verse twelve and, ver- and chapter one or verse one of chapter twelve. Kind of like a bookmark. It's setting up the complete closure of the section of the book. Now, not not that we haven't heard these charges before, but Hosea here continues judgment on Ephraim. Look at verse 12 again and verse 1. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria, and oil is carried to Egypt. So there are those two verses that we're talking about. Now, Israel's situation doesn't look very good, does it? No, it hasn't for a long time. Since chapter 3 or 4, it hasn't looked good. But Judah was still walking with God here. How long did Judah remain faithful? Give me a rough estimation. How long did Judah remain faithful from Israel's exile? Negative. Not even close, Harry. Let's subtract that by uh, 150, 28 years. Exactly what one generation. One, well, you barked that out, Harry, like you knew what you were talking about. 170 years! <laughs> it was 28 years. So obviously when this was written, this, this really, this... This chapter is written really to the southern kingdom. Now, they had their own prophet. They had one of the greatest prophets out there. They had Isaiah in the southern kingdom. Hosea was stuck with the northern tribe. But a lot of Hosea's aiming in his, in, in, in his verses, in his, in his scriptures, were actually towards the southern kingdom, including this one. Again, it was 28 years of the fall of Israel until they rebelled just as the northern tribes had and were overtaken by who? We know Assyria took out the northern kingdom. Who took out the southern kingdom? Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, yes. But God always had his heart set on Judah. The southern kingdom was always the apple of his eye because that's where the lineage of Jesus Christ came from. The northern, northern tribes never, never collected, but the southern tribes had many, many types of Christ to rescue them. You know, Daniel was one, right? Uh, Esther. Mordecai were other ones that always rescued and played types of Christ to the southern kingdom. Okay, so um, this message really served as a warning to the southern kingdom because the northern kingdom, I think God had already given up on them. I mean, he's offering repentance and, you know, seek the Lord and do this and wait patiently, I'm in. But, but they were in such a depraved state. They did nothing but rebel. They did nothing but rebel. So what they're going to do, both of these, southern kingdom and northern kingdom, they can both relate to Jacob, which is why Hosea brings up Jacob here. Why? Because Jacob was the founder 
of Israel. He was the founder of the Jewish people. Okay, look at verse 2. He brings up Jacob now. The Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. Now, in saying that Jacob is whom God will punish, Hosea has all of Israel in mind here. He's not just targeting the northern kingdom. By saying Jacob, he's saying all of Israel in mind, including Judah, as it faced temptations to rebel and foolishness, just as Israel had done. You say, but wait a minute, Ted, Judah hasn't rebelled yet. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. God knew Judah was going to rebel in 28 years. That's why I love you. He gave him 28 years of warning, let alone after Israel fell, right? And since Judah and Israel were accused of waywardness and deceit, the root of these sins is found in their shared DNA with Jacob. Jacob was not (laughs) a very good person. Hosea's opening point is that Israel's characteristics of self-reliant deceit was no surprise since they defined the wayward character of the nation's famous forebearer, Jacob. Look at verse 3. It says, in the womb, now he's talking about Jacob, he took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood he strove with God. Can anyone describe for me what Hosea means by that? What does he mean by he took his brother by the heel? What is, it, what is, what is he trying to say? What kind of parable or proverb does he mean by that? What did he try to do with his brother? Yeah. Exactly. All throughout his early life, Jacob continued scheming and conniving with the help of his mother, especially when he cheated his brother Esau out of the covenant promise. And how did Jacob do that? Pick this file. Go to Gen- We're in Genesis. Go to 25. Go to chapter 25, verse 20. I got 29 written down here. Genesis 25, starting in verse 29. Now, I know we know the stories, but it's always nice to see them for ourselves and to put them to today's text. Genesis 25. Starting in verse 29. I got the same thing. Bad day to take the small print Bible. Okay. Okay. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Obviously, he didn't care about his birthright. He just wanted to. Now, who likes a bowl of lentil stew? Janet? Rob, I know my wife likes lentil stew. Girlfriend, you you back there? Lentil soup. Well, this says stew. There's got to be a little meat in. Does this say soup or stew? Stew. There's some meat in there. Probably some rabbit. Verse 20, so wait, John says go to verse 26. Oh, yeah, thank you, John. Awesome. Afterward, his brother came out hand, holding his heel, so his name was called Jacob. He was holding on to his heel. I had that written down, John, but I passed it over there. <laughs> oh, James said it too? I'm so sorry, guys. I, I like hearing myself so much, I don't like tuning you guys out. No, I'm kidding. I didn't, I didn't hear you, James. Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, later on in Genesis 27, Jacob also stole Esau's blessing. Go to chapter 27 real quick. I mean, this guy was a real tool. Oh, he did. Yeah. Well, Esau was just this big hunter dude with a lot of hair on him. Jacob, Jacob was seriously, he was a mama's boy. He really was. Uh, chapter 27. I'm sorry? 
Well, we're going to talk about that. Why do you got to skip ahead? Why don't you just read, come Lord Jesus, and we'll just go home. It's the very last verse of the Bible. Stealing my thunder. How dare you? <laughs> Let's read chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his oldest son, to him. He said, My son, and he answered, Here am I. He said, Behold, I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapon, your quiver, your bow, go out in the field and hunt game for me. Prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I might eat, and that my soul may bless you before, before I die. Now Rebekah was listening to Isaac, spoke to his son Esau, so when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord uh, before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock, bring me two good young goats that I may prepare for, from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob said to Re Rebekah's mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm, smooth, I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I it shall be uh, uh, mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them, brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved, and Rebekah took, took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were uh, in her house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. The skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and bread which he had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went in to his father, said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to, to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were her hairy, like his brother's Esau hand, so he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. And he said, Bring me, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, of plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. Nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. So, from the moment of his birth, basically, to, until the years of manhood, Jacob practiced deceit. So as Israel, throughout its history, you see what Jose is painting a picture here. You're no different than your forefathers. The northern kingdom. At this present moment, you are no different than Jacob. In other words, the apple did not fall far from the tree. Jacob's character, hold your place in Genesis. We're going to be going back and forth there. Um, Jacob's character didn't improve when he got older, neither. Look at verse, the end of verse 3. And in his manhood, in his manhood, he strove with God. What does that mean? What does it mean to strove? What does strove mean? Yeah, stroving is really striving to obtain something no matter what. Verse 4 there says, look, he also strove with an angel and prevailed. Now, no doubt these words uh, refer to a few dramatic scenes in Jacob's life. And Janet just spilled the guts. One of them was wrestling with an angel. He actually wrestled with an angel. 
Some say it was God. We don't know. Go to Genesis 32 now, starting in verse 20. Let's look at this story real quick. Genesis 32. Starting in verses 22. What did God say this? The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and, and Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, maybe Jacob wasn't a mama's boy after all. Maybe Jacob had some guns on him, right? He did not prevail. Oh, now I lost my place. I hate the small print Bible. Okay. When the man saw he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for this day, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Well, there you go. But Israel. I lost my place again. This is incredible. Thank you. I really can't read this. Do you know? Okay, you should call. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called to the name of the place, Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Some say he was actually wrestling with the, an angel of the Lord or the Lord. Anyway, Hosea is now tells uh, of Jacob's story, taking a turn for the worse here. Look at it, if you're there in Hosea again, look at the end of verse 4. He wept and sought his favor. What what did this, what, what happened here? You know, we know he wrestled with God in the first part, but what happened here? He sought, what did he say? He, he wept and sought his favor. Who was Jacob afraid of? Hmm. Didn't even want to meet with Esau. Could you blame him? Right? Didn't he even want to meet with him? He was Pleading, absolutely pleading with God for favor in this. Uh, if you're in Genesis, right 33, really next text down, look at verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Lee and Rachel and two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front. Then Lee and her children and Rachel and Joseph, last of all, he himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground, seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Think it had anything to do with bowing down seven times to the ground, just pleading and weeping, raising his voice to the Lord? Absolutely. Crying in fear over the might of Esau, who was likely filled with hate, Jacob had sent all his possessed, even his wives, Children in vain attempt to bribe his brother into favor, yet God spared Jacob and Esau welcomed his brother. Wow. Wow. Talk about answered prayer. Yeah, go ahead, Jared. Mm -hmm. That was it right after the rest one night. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Exactly the same thing. Twelve sons, right? Joseph, twelve sons. Uh, which McCall, too. Um, now we're going to get to what Joyce jumped ahead of me on. Why did God spare Jacob, Joyce? Yeah. Yeah, he was he was God's elect, right? What, is, what does Romans say? Romans chapter nine. I mean, think about it. Esau was this big, mighty hunter. He was awesome. He was bold. Jacob was a mama's boy. He just he was a conniver. But why? Because Jacob was God's elect. Romans Romans nine, and not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. 
though they were not yet born, had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, he was told, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, Esau I have hated. Now, did he hate Esau? No, he hated or loved Esau, I should say. Jacob, of course, God loves him. Oh, oh. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's your election right there. So Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. In other words, before the foundation of the world, God had all his sheep. God had selected all his children, including us. Before the foundation of the world, we were in already written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, if you look at it, Paul goes on to say, does that mean there's no justice in God? God is, no, by no means. God is, has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Esau, Esau went on to marry, if you look at the next chapter, chapter 34, Esau went out, out to marry an Ishmaelite. He's, that, what did we talk about Ishmael? We were talking in Galatians. Ishmael was the start of the Arabs. So Esau sided with the Arab nation. See that? I, I don't necessarily think so. No, I don't think, Esau? Oh, the, the Edomites. Yeah, that's why I said Edom, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, they've always, well, Arabs too. Arabs, Edomites, they're all, they're, everybody in the entire world today is an enemy of the Jewish people. But it started way back here. It started with Hagar and, and Sarah. Really, they were the first two, yeah. Yes. Absolutely, Chris. Because second, yeah, Second Timothy says people look on the outside. People look at works and goodness and grace. God looks at the heart of a man, right? That's how. That's why he chose David. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Psalm 5.5 five says, God hates all workers of iniquity. Yeah. saw that last chapter that I, I, I nurtured you like a babe. I, I, yeah, we saw that. And yet they keep rebelling, 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 rebelling. Re, rebel and rebellion. 
but but there's no mention of, of scheming now or deceiving now. Uh, it was at Bethel. I'm sorry, it was at Bethel. Look at verse 4, the end of verse 4. We're talking about Jacob still. He met God at Bethel, and there God spoke with us. There's no more scheming, no more deceiving anymore. Jacob's grown up. He put his big boy pants on when he first met with God, uh, who spoke to him here about the stairway to heaven. You, know, you guys remember the stairway to heaven, right? No, not Led Zeppelin. Joyce. We're talking about <laughs> we're talking about Jacob's ladder. Yeah. Uh, look at look at Genesis chapter 28. Let's let's see what God promises Jacob. This is one of the most beautiful uh, scriptures uh, in, in the Word of God. Jacob's ladder. I love this. This is where. Um, this is where he was promised in salvation by grace through faith alone. Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. And then we're done with Genesis. Because we're almost done with Jacob here in, in the first part of this text. This is verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down at the place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land of which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be, shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall be all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone he had put under his head, set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of this place Bethel. The name of the city was Luz at first. And Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of it you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Might be one of the first tithes in scripture, right? So knowing God in faith now, Jacob did not bargain or connive simply receive these beautiful promises from our sovereign God. Now by recounting these events, Hosea is showing, he's showing Israel that the Jacob who received salvation was the very opposite of what Israel was doing, what they had become. God had offered Israel salvation. He called them to be his people. And all they did was what? Corrupt themselves, erecting idols. Where was the first place they erected an idol? Bethel, exactly where God met Jacob. You see the smack in the face here by Hosea. This is where God met Jacob, and this is where you erected, Israel, your first idol. That was a good one, Chris. God met Jacob at Bethel and gave him all those promises that out of your seed shall all these nations thou be blessed. The Israelites, the northern kingdom, in Hosea's day, the first place they put up a false idol was Bethel. Kind of like a kind of like a smack. Um, whereas God, Jacob met God there and worshipped God there first. And the Israelites, the northern kingdom, erected um, idols there. You know, I think about you know, think about this wrestling that Jacob had with God. It's kind of similar to what we talked about last week. Romans chapter 7, we, we all have these wrestling matches, don't we? I mean, not physically. This was a physical wrestling match. But we, we do wrestle um, with God. This is exactly what we learned about Sunday, about the flesh and the spirit are always at war with each other. It's, no, it's nothing more than wrestling with God. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is God. And we wrestle, our flesh wrestles with the third person of the Trinity. So we all have that kind of that, that, that wrestling. I, I'd probably rather wrestle them physically, only because some of that that wrestling that we have in our minds, man, that's it's tough sometimes, isn't it? And as we talked about Sunday, you, um, 
But we often have confidence in ourselves rather than blessings from God. We think we know what's best for us and our Heavenly Father, so we wrestle with these feelings. Right? We do. Sometimes we don't like, we just don't like where God is directing us. I don't want to go down that path. That means I lose this freedom. Right? I don't want to be in this ministry because then everybody will see me. I'm going to have to give up some of my lifestyle. If you're going to, you're going to call me to the pulpit, I've got to give up some of this lifestyle that I enjoy too much. Some of that, some of that leading, and you wrestle with your nature. Because our nature is so powerful, is it? Powerful. Sinful nature. And we saw Paul struggle with that. But we finally get to the point where we just hang on to him. Kind of like Jacob did. I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. Yeah, yeah. I ain't going to go until you bless me. I, I, I love that. Even this morning, I, t- I took the dogs for a walk, and a lot of times I convince myself. I took the dogs for a walk this last morning. I was just thinking, just pondering about the, about the flesh. And, it's just, and, I, and I think I've shared this with you guys Sunday, that every morning I wake up and I just, I, I almost have a conversation with the Holy Spirit within me. I just say, suppress the flesh. No weak moments in this flesh. Not, let's not have any opportunities for sin to guide me, you know. I mean, so I talk to myself a lot these days because I need to. You've got to have that conversation, right, with yourself. Don't just assume you're going to have a glorious day because you're an elect of God. It doesn't happen that way. It just doesn't. So with this plea, Hosea concludes the short sermon about Jacob's life. Look at verse 6. We're done in, uh, we're done in uh, Genesis, now verse 6. So you, by the help of God, your God, return. He's talking to Israel now. Hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for the Lord. Just as Jacob came back to Bethel, where God had met him and received his promises, Hosea is telling Israel to return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. He's done this every chapter, has he not? He's talking about judgment. He's talking about how, how evil Ephraim is, Israel. But he says, oh, there's always one verse in there that says return. There's always one verse in there. Jacob was saved by striving, as Chris said, seeking, knocking, setting aside his dishonesty, his manipulating. Stop picking on me, Mom. Stop stop twisting my arms and manipulate Dad. Stop. And started seeking God's favor and God's will. Jose, unfortunately, was writing to a people that judgment has already been decided. But he's saying, even though you're going to be taken away to Assyria, guys, God is still going to be merciful if you wait on the Lord. Go there in exile. This is your punishment. But go there and repent and wait on the Lord. That, that type of discipline will lead you to salvation. Wait continually for the Lord. He's telling them while they're in exile, repent and wait. And waiting always implies an attitude of faith, doesn't it? Waiting always implies an attitude of faith. We, especially in our culture, we want everything yesterday. We want, it, we, want it, we, want it solved. we want it solved now, and if you can't do it now, God, then I'm going to do it my way. That's our culture today. Nobody waits on the Lord anymore. Nobody has, nobody has time. Fortunately for Israel, it was too late for his generation. Look at verse 7. A merchant in whose hands are false balances, who loves to oppress. Ephraim has said, Oh, but I'm rich. I have found wealth for myself, and all my labors they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. How pompous is that? Israel resembles a dishonest businessman who cheats his customers with, with false scales, trusting wealth rather than God. Think about it. God blessed them with the promised land, land full of milk and honey. They enjoyed riches. They formed an identity and a standard of living they enjoyed, forgetting from whose hand their wealth was given. They were worshiping the wealth, not the wealth giver. Yeah. 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 Right? They forgot about the wealth provider. 
They, they thought they were just patting themselves on the back, forgetting about the wealth guy. It's no wonder why Jesus said you can't serve God in money. It's no wonder why he said that. It's one to be blessed by God with wealth when you exercise it in stewardship for doing good. But to delight in wealth, boast in what you possess, and can do for yourself is to give grave offense to God and invite severe judgment. That's why Paul says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money is the root of all kinds of evil, it's the love of it. It's the love of it. What are you don't, doing? Don't you also notice, that, and we see this with the Babylonian king that stepped out on his porch and was like, look at my great... Don't we notice that this is kind of like a common denominator in, in certain kingdoms? you got these people or kingdoms yep. that turn and say... Oh, look at our great spoils, or look at our great work, and then boom, here comes the fall. Yeah. Pride then comes fall. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But Nebuchadnezzar, well, also is a future child of God. That's all I love about that. That's so he really humbled them. Jesus said, those who humble themselves to be exalted. That's right. Exalted. Those who exalt themselves to be humble. And even, even humility comes from God. Yeah. We don't, we don't do that. We, we can't do that. Yeah. That comes from God. Look at verse 8. In all my, this is, this is, this is their pompous thought. In all my labors. They cannot find in me iniquity or sin. Are they claiming innocence here, though? No. No, they're not. In other words, you ain't going to catch me. You ain't going to catch me. Our guilt, that their guilt is so cunningly covered up that nobody will discover it. That's how pompous they were. I'm going to hide in secret. Who's all their wealth going to? Syria. Syria's going to take out all their wealth. None. What did Jesus warn about earthly riches? What did Jesus say about earthly riches? Chris? He talks about storing up our, our riches in heaven. Yeah. And the earthly riches were the moth or the rust and ghetto of Robert. Yeah, Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 30, <coughs> verse 33. Yeah. 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 Because thieves can't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, the end with this is the key. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, do you, what do you really want? Right? Young or true, had it all. Walk, you walk out. You had a godly life. He just had a pretty good bank account. And Jesus says, Jesus tested his heart. Well, sell all you have. You're doing everything else right. Everything else you're doing is right. Just sell your wealth and give to the poor. He walked away, man. Because he loved it. That's where his heart was. Jesus was saying, yeah. So by worshiping their wealth, made Israel forget God, yet God reminded them by entering the verse line. Look at verse 9. I am the Lord. I am the Lord from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. What's he referring to there? The Feast of Booths, yeah. When people lived in booths and humility in Israel's time, in the wilderness after leaving Egypt, they loved God so much they were willing to live in tents. Far from living in tents and humility, remembering God, now they're living in luxury, forgetting God. You see the difference here? You see the difference there? That's why the Bible says it's very difficult for a rich man to get into heaven because it's the poor person that always needs the hand of God. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes, hey guys, we forget about God sometimes. Yeah. When things are really going good for us, right? I mean, things are really going good for us. Our relationships, our job, yeah, everything just seems to be flowing like butter. And then we kind of forget God, don't we? And then he throws a little trial in our life. <coughs> hey, up here. And we only remember, and then we stop coming to church. I got, I got everything going on. I'm living so large, man. I'm going to start playing golf a couple times a month. So I'm not going to come to church. I'm going to skip Bible studies on Wednesday sometimes because, I don't know, I'm going to start eating late. Just start streaming television. You know, stop, I'm going to stop fellowship and I'm going to stop these things. Um, and we remember him only in our trials. We come back to church. That's not worship. That's basically treating God as a genie. You only worship him when you do well. But we're commanded to public worship in good times and in bad. Of course, Hebrews chapter 10, right? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. I don't know about you, but I know quite a few people that just just tired of church. And they lose this command. This is a command. They're just tired. Church beat me up. No, people beat you up. Church may beat you up. 
But this is a command. Would, 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 would God ever beat you up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, Israel needed to learn a lesson here. I mean, that's obvious. Did they not? Oh, my gosh. They were awful. They needed to learn a lesson. So when Israel had forgotten on Easy Street, they would have to relearn now on Skid Row. I like that. When they forgot on Easy Street, they had to relearn on Skid Row. When they were in their wealthiest, now they're being taken down to the Skid Row in exile in Syria to relearn everything God had taught them. But that's like with us, too. Things are going good. It's when those trials come in. Guys, we learn more in our trials than we could ever learn in our, in our seasons of good times. Amen. Right? Amen. We learn so much so much more in us. We don't like our trials, but they're needed. They're needed. Speaking of, I think Chris mentioned it, Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. Man, I'm going to have to start talking fast. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. This, this really says perfectly why we receive chastisement from the hand of God. Hebrews 12. It's very important to see this. Starting in verse 3. Boy, we're getting a lot of reading done today, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, have you, have you not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood? And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Beside this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of Spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, and it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. That's why he, prunes, that's why he disciplines us. So we may become more like his son. Keep going in there. For you know afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, was, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, Verse 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful. Can we get a testify on that? Rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Perfect. Yeah. That is absolutely perfect. We do not welcome it, but it's for our own good and for His glory. <clears throat> now, it's not like God never warned them. They had no excuse. Let's look at verse 10. So I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. Verse 13. By the prophet of the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt and by a prophet he was guarded. The prophet here in verse 10 of course was Hosea himself and Isaiah who prophesied to Israel um, while Judah was prophesied by uh, Elijah. Uh, who's the prophet in verse 13? Of course, that was Moses. Moses was the prophet there. Look at verse 12. Israel begins conviction by recalling Jacob's sojourn into Aram, seeking a wife. It says there, Jacob fled to Aram. There, Israel served as a wife, and for a wife, he guarded sheep. Does anybody remember this story about Jacob? Yeah. You want to share with us? How long did he have to serve, Janet? Seven, 14 years. 14 total? Yeah. But seven. The king did him no good. He went out there, fell in love with the younger. So he served 
he was tending sheep for seven years. After the seven years, Father gives him the older, the ugly one. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> so he had to serve another seven years. He ended up taking both of them home. <laughs> but but, didn't, but yeah. didn't Leah's son with him become the line of Jesus? Yeah. 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 Leah and Rachel. Yeah. That's when <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. But but Abram, what, what, what Jose is saying here, Abram and Egypt were places of supposed refuge that became scenes of bondage. And from both places, Jacob and his offspring were driven out, and in both cases, God was faithful to provide for both of their deliverance. Jose concludes here at verse 14. Now, Ephraim, verse 14, Ephraim has given bitter provocation. So his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and will repay him for his disgraceful deeds. Again, Israel constantly provoked God through idolatry. And these crimes were made grievous by the background of God's covenant love. Covenant love. This generation would not repent. And God's grace had run out on Ephraim. This generation just would not repent. Because we have, we have seen, and as shepherds, why he brought up the shepherd part is, Shepherd separates the goats from the sheep. God separated Ephraim slash Israel from his sheep. Do you have any scripture that points to how long they were doing this before God did this? Was it like 10, 20 years? Oh, gosh, no. I was trying to read to see if there's any kind of clues on how long they've been doing this. Yeah, it was a generation full. So usually a generation is usually 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. Now, we, now, to finish off this study, we've got to go back up to verse 10 and 11 real quick. Verse 10 was their warning. Verse 11 provides a riddle that alludes to Ephraim's judgment. Look at verse 10 and 11. I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions. Through the prophets gave power. If there is iniquity in Gilead, they shall surely come to nothing. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Their altars also are like stone heaps. On the furrows of the field, they just just would not listen to God. They just decided to, decided to continue to worship Baal. And people like this are, are, are prophesied by Isaiah. This is this is perfect. Isaiah will close in this verse. He says, Isaiah chapter six. He says, "Go and say to this people." He's talking to Isaiah. Was the southern kingdom? Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. And their ears heavy, and they're blind, and, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. But they didn't do any of the above. Any of the above. That concludes. Woo! I'm oh, sorry, guys. I kept y'all here an hour. That concludes today's text. Anybody have anything to add? Or praise God. For that. You know. Oh, only the fact that this is like I just kept on thinking America, America, America. The more and more I was reading about it, I was like, oh man, that's kind of like what we're doing right now. That's why I asked you how long, because it's like, man, we've been doing it for like at least 20 well, years. Well, <laughs> I had a conversation with someone um, about King, about um, the uh, world powers. We were talking about all the Bible's world powers. Not one world power lasted over 150 years. Wow. We're talking Babylon. We're talking Rome. We're talking Persia. We're talking Alexander the Great and the Greek army. All these wonderful and massive empires didn't last more than 150 years. America's going over 200 years. Yeah. It's just, it's just a matter of time. It makes sense for us it's to just, be the last it, one. It is. It, it's just a matter of time. And I tell people, I just, you know, now, today's the day of salvation. You say, well, how can, how can they wipe out America? He says, well, you've got to read Revelation. I says, there's, there's an earthquake that is strong enough to wipe out North America, Central America, and South America. That is one third of the world. Yeah. And, then you know, and the Bible, yeah, the Bible, yeah, they got that. That's, that's taking man out of it. This is God's judgment. Yeah. I saw a documentary talking about the super volcano in Yellowstone. If that thing goes off, that's like... That's the, gone. That's the one. That's the one. It's, it's, it's yeah. powerful yeah. enough yeah. to put a third of the world in outer darkness and edge. Yeah. 
Which is a third of the third of the world, which is the Bible talks about in Revelation. Yeah. So how we can say America? We're God, buddy. God's gonna take us out with, with his own creation. Yeah. With his own creation. We don't gotta deal with any of that. We'll but it out. makes sense. I mean, look at what we were just looking at with Ephraim, right? Where he was saying, I took you out of tabernacles, right? Yeah. And so look at America. If you look at America, I don't know, a hundred years ago, right? People still believe, I mean, even the racist people that had slaves no, yeah. in the Bible. Yeah, what, <laughs> what I'm saying is saying to Israel, you got the word of God. We have churches on every corner here yeah. in America. Now we've we're free to stuff. worship, and we're the most immoral country on the planet. Yeah. Right? With God right in our backyard, because there's churches everywhere. Word of God everywhere. Well, I was thinking, um, oh, this is back to what you're thinking. I, I was thinking Leah was God's place for Jacob. And Judah came out of Leah. Yeah. And so it's, it's a lot of Jesus came out of uh, out of Judas. Yeah. So, so but Jacob had chosen. Well, he had. Well, obviously, he had 12 Sarah. kids, but he had no, but more he than. Yeah, he had. More than two babies. Oh, yeah. He had yeah, four. Yeah. But it really all it really all started with Sarah and, yeah. and Hagar. Yeah. That started the whole <coughs> chain of But still, action. I mean, it, of the ones he had picked, Rachel, like God gave him Leah first. Mm -hmm. so and Leah always strived for his love too, which was yeah. so, so messed up because Leah just wanted him to love her. Do you remember? That's yeah. why she kept on getting pregnant, and yeah. then he yeah. still wants her Rachel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because back then women the father was in the children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and think about it. Every time Jacob was going to have a child, she and think about it. It was the that's right. Mm -hmm. And she would pray to God every time she had a kid. Oh, yeah. you know, and name the kids yeah. after old yeah. because God has seen the or yeah. God has, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting stuff. So, so I love listen, the old it's really interesting. Yeah. Are we up? We need some help with all that couch and Oh, okay. So we'll do that. If we can find a strong couple. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> Chris alone. <laughs> Single he said Christ alone. Christ alone. Y'all good? Yes. Yeah. All right. I had a good teacher one time, and he gave me a little phrase that I always remember. He said, when you're on your back, you look up to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. No, it's very true. Yeah. But even when we're, 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 up, we're on our pedestal, we still look up to God. Right? Because that's when we, when we mostly, that's what Israel's fault was. They weren't on their backs. Right there. Right. They were on the pedestal. Mm -hmm. you know, so they got when God blesses us, we It's not like they didn't get warned. They got warned plenty of times. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? Right. Is it rough? Ooh. Well, we were talking about Romans before. Yeah. Um, Jacob I loved and he Esau hated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people will say, well, God doesn't hate. He can't hate, like Jared was mentioning. Yeah. And my God is a God of love. Mm -hmm. love, love. Yeah. And even back in Deuteronomy, Chapter 32, verse 39, it says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill, and I I'm make sure. alive. I wound, and I heal. Mm -hmm. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So God tells you, point blank, I do it all. Yeah. He says it in Isaiah 55, too. It's like, that, that's a common denial. I am God. I am not. Yeah. This is not a democracy. Can He's the true Savior. Hey, think about some of the Old Testament stories. He wiped out 180,000 soldiers probably with one angel. One angel. <laughs> Just because they made God angry. I mean, so, I mean, if, if the world knew about those stories, I think, you know, I think they're ignorant of the Word of God. Right? The, the angels then said, love, love, love. They said, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. That's, That's right. right. That's Amen. right. Amen. I think many churches count on the fact that their parishioners yeah. yeah, most 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 are. I'm grateful yeah. that it's not the case here. I mean, it's bright. Praise God for that. When you think that. Yeah, but I didn't see that on like YouTube. I was watching a video the other day, and the guy was like, you know, he he's talking about church. He was like, hey, you know, as long as you go to church and you get like an hour a week, and I'm thinking an hour a week. What is it? <laughs> an hour a week? I you spend one hour a morning, hour. and I still don't get enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, but, but that's how they're convincing everybody. They're like, oh, if you just spent just a little, read, read one verse Check out of one chapter a week. And I'm like, bro, you wouldn't get the Genesis. But like, that's because you're trying to put the Yeah. 
Hey, we're going to be here till Sunday. I know. <laughs> I have no problem with that. But some people want to get home. They don't want to be the first ones to stand up. <laughs> Why don't we close in prayer? Father, thank you, Lord. We can talk all night about you and your word, Father. And we're grateful for that. Lord. We're grateful for the, for, the, for, the, for the hunger and the encouragement that your word gives us. Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing it is, Lord, to just talk to Scripture for others, Lord. There's no, better, there's no greater blessing in the world than to understand your word relay it to those Lord, who don't know. And even to talk amongst brothers and sisters, Lord, about your glory and what, what, what you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Father, for the chastisement, the pruning that you do in our lives. Even though it, even though it hurts, Lord, it's for your glory and our good. We're grateful for the ups and the downs in our lives, Father. And I pray if there's anybody in the downtime, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for them, Father. <coughs> that your grace is sufficient for them. And there is a life here, Father, and it's not a training time. Lord Jesus Christ, call them home. So thank you for that beautiful, wonderful truth. Thank you that we are the elect children of God. Father, what a blessing. All for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Love y'all.